Howdy everybody, Steve here, KM9G. We've been playing with Windling for a bit now, so if you haven't seen any of those videos, check them out before this one because they're all like foundational to get you here. Or just watch this one anyway because we don't like watching, we don't like reading manuals or anything like that. What we're going to do today though is we're going to set up a Windlink RMS gateway and we're going to do it the easiest way possible with a little teeny tiny micro SD card. These things are ridiculous. This one's 32 gigs and this isn't the biggest one I have. Remember your big old five meg hard drives from way back when? Yeah, me neither, I'm too young for that. How we're gonna do this is we're gonna use KM6LYW's DigiPi image. And this is gonna set us up with a 1200 baud packet Winlink RMS gateway server. And that's gonna be really useful for two meter HT type work. And maybe if I can figure out how to get far enough away from myself, I can also show you how to do that in a future video with HF type stuff. But for right now, this is gonna be connected to my ICOM 705 radio and to a Raspberry Pi and to the KM6 LYW DigiPi image. Before we get too far, you do need to have a call sign and you do need to have authorization from the back end. So get yourself a call sign that you're going to use for this. Most of your gateways are dash 10 for an SSID by default. So I'm using the K Toads call sign for this, setting up a RMS gateway for our Toads Club. And it will be K Toads dash 10, KT0 ADS dash 10 for the station ID at the end. So in order to do that, you have to have a valid call sign. You have to have signed up for WinLink and actually use the WinLink service. And if you haven't done that yet, there is a video right up here in the corner. It's the previous video in this series of how to get that done. Do that first, and then you send an email to the Gateway team. I will leave this link in the description down below, but it is winlink.org, and then become a WinLink Gateway Sysop down here on the bottom right. And here is all of the guidelines. Read this entire page. I'm not going to read it to you but you must first be an active user of radio email. And I was for my personal call sign, but I was not for the club call. So I actually had to set up a club call sign as a WinLink user. And then this tells you a whole bunch of stuff down here as to what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to operate within the lawful parameters of your country. So in the US, that means that your remote station needs to be remotely power off a bull from wherever you happen to be in order to maintain physical control. And then authorization request, send an email to Steve Waterman right here currently k4cjx and indicate your name and call sign indicate the call sign of the gateway station so in my case it was km9g is my call sign and then the base call sign of the gateway station is ktoads kt0ads the call sign must be under your direct control as licensee or trustee and it is because i am the trustee of the club call and i am the licensee of my own call sign state your agreement and commitment to operate within these guidelines just be really straightforward because Steve does this stuff all day long. He doesn't need a whole long-winded answer. So you can actually just do number one, KM9G. Number two, KToads. Number three, I agree. Number four, a reference to confirm your application with the, an established MCOM organization if you intend to operate the station as a temporary or portable asset. And I am not established with an MCOM organization for the club. Follow all the rest of this stuff, which basically says if you're trying to do a club call and you don't own the club call as a trustee or legal licensee, you can't do it. So ask somebody else to do it for you and then help them through the process. Send the email and then Steve will get back to you with information in the email. And Steve is a pretty busy guy. So if he doesn't get back to you within a reasonable amount of time, email him again, because it might've gotten into his spam folder or his junk folder or anything along those lines. It took me a while to get my message through. So it might take you a while to get your message through. Once you have that all squared away, now we can go do some downloading of some software. So this is the website for digipi.org and Craig is a software engineer, not a web designer. So we'll, f we'll forgive him on this, but this is a pretty slick little setup here. We'll show you some more once we get it all downloaded. In order to download this, you need to be a member of his Patreon page. And if you are not, then do that first. And that will get you the user ID and password you need. If you don't understand why you might need to support him on Patreon, let me give you a little tiny bit of a background. This is a ton of effort. Like this man has moved a mountain to get this image up and running. And he's produced a ton of videos on the subject here. And every one of his videos has this really cool little guitar riff that he plays in the beginning is bumper music. So I like it's worth it just to watch him come up with some new song that he wants to play for you guys. But at the very least, there is a ton of stuff here about how to do all this packet stuff. And he has done all of this work for you to get you there. And that's why this video is going to be real short. And I'm just kind of like puffing to get the time out here because this is pretty awesome stuff. So anyway, 
become a patron of the channel. I'm not signed into my browser account here, but if I become a member, $5 a month to get this stuff squared away, not bad at all. So once you've got that all squared away and you have the user ID and password in your email box, the next thing is to click this download button here. And that's gonna ask you where to save the file. So save it in a folder that you know where to save it. I am doing this on Mac OS, so I am saving it in the directory where I'm actually storing all the parts of making this video. So hit save and then save away. After you got the download, then you need to burn it to an SD card. And my favorite burn tool is this Belina Etcher thing right over here. And I really like it because it works where other things don't. There was a scandal a while back. If you were trying to do a firmware upgrade on the X6100 or the X6200 radio from Zygu, it would brick your radio if you used the tool that they specified, Rufus. And using Belina Etcher didn't have that problem. So another feather in the cap of Belina Etcher here. If you click on this download link, and the website URL will be in the description below. If you click on the download link, Etcher is available for all platforms. Linux, Mac, Windows, and on Mac, I'm running Apple Silicon here on this side, so I need the ARM64 version. Click download and run through the installer. I'm not gonna go over how to install the software in this video because it's already installed here and all three of these have three different methods of doing it. I had a computer for the last 20, 30 minutes or so, you know how to install software. Otherwise, how are you watching this on a web browser on your computer? I know, you're all watching this on your couch. This is prime time entertainment right here. All right, so we got that all downloaded. We got it installed. Now I need to flash from file. I'm going to pick the image that I downloaded. I am going to pick the SD card. This is one of the cool things about Etcher is it doesn't give you the ability to overwrite your local hard disk with an SD card image, which would be kind of bad. I mean, you can, you can do it if you try really hard, but don't try really hard. So I'm gonna pick the SD card. It was a 32 gig SD card. I put in a 32 gig SD card into the drive. It showed up on the screen as a 32 gig SD card. I think I've got a pretty good match there. It's certainly not a 500 gig hard disk inside my laptop. So I'm gonna select one and only one, and then I'm gonna do flash. And we'll be back when it's all done because it takes some time. All right, the SD card finished burning. I put it into my Raspberry Pi and I turned the Raspberry Pi on. From there, it's going to come up with its own automatic hotspot, its own Wi-Fi presence. And we need to connect to that Wi-Fi network to configure it for our Wi-Fi network. I tried putting on the, uh, WPA supplicant file and the network config file for either version of Raspberry Pi OS and neither of those two worked, but this works fine. So we will carry on with doing this thing. It'll take it a little while to pop up. So give it a little bit of a time and then there it is, DigiPi right above my head. So I'm gonna click on that and then this has no internet connection. So basically this and only this, which is fine. And then in your browser, you want to go to 10.0.0.5. That's the default address for getting there. And you want to do it without HTTPS because this is ham radio and nothing's allowed to be encrypted. Also, you got to pay for a certificate to prove that you trust yourself. So just trust yourself. It'll be fine. It pops up all by itself right here. The first thing I want to do is I want to do a... Wi-Fi. I don't want to do the initialize just yet, and I'll tell you why when we get past that step, but I want to get this thing on my own network. So I click on Wi-Fi, and now I type in my SSID and my password, and then I hit submit, and it says Wi-Fi credentials are updated. Please reboot for changes to take effect, and there's a convenient reboot button here. So I'm going to hit reboot, and we'll be back when it's rebooted. And you can try HTTP colon slash slash digipy, because it'll do auto DNS stuff for you. Or you can do digipy.local, or you can find it in your router, whatever IP address was assigned to it by your router, because now it's on your network where you should be. And there it is. Now that we have all of that done, and we're back onto the actual internet connected network, I'm gonna click this initialize button, which is gonna bring up a new tab. You can really only do this once. If you need to do this a second time to reconfigure it for something else, either A, get another Raspberry Pi and another SD card and do a whole nother DigiPi system, or B, reburn the SD card that you have, because it's actually easier just to reburn the SD card than it is to go through and do all the config files, because Craig has figured all this stuff out for you. So in my case, my gateway is set up as KTODs, KT0ADS. So if you happen to see KTODs in your list of available networks, give it a shot. So there is the call sign and then the password, the WinLink password, we'll put that in at the end because it doesn't star out the password. The APRS gateway password, this is why I wanted to be on the real internet. You don't need to fill out all of this stuff to do a WinLink gateway, but I wanna set it once and, and use it for, for many different things. So if I hit the generate button, your APRS password isn't really a password, it's just a, a hash of your call sign, KT0ADS. So this isn't a secret and it tells me my code is 19620. It works with my call sign and with my code. So use it with your call sign and your code, not mine, 19620. 
and then my grid square. There's a little find tool here. Again, this is why I wanted to be on the internet to do this. Click on find, and this is the Levine Central website, which I highly recommend using. It's actually the one that I use in all of my videos, and it'll be linked in the description down below as well, if I remember. I'm currently in Benson, Arizona, while I'm setting this thing up for testing, so let me get the grid square for Benson, and it is DM41UX. Latitude, longitude, same thing. I'm gonna do locate, and I'll type in Benson, Arizona. And that tells me my latitude and my longitude. So now I've got both of those typed in. And then my AX25 node pass, this is the password that users will use to connect to your AX25 node if you use it in the future. We do not need this for the purposes of this video for WinLink Gateway stuff. But again, I'm, I'm setting everything up. ABC123 is just fine. The screen type, this is where it gets pretty cool. There are two different screen types. I have the little tiny square one and I have the great big one on order. When the great big one comes here, we'll show that in a future video. But for now, it's the small one. If you don't have one at all, just pick the small one because you don't actually need the display. It's just real pretty eye candy to look at. And I happen to like it. I am not going to use FL rig for cat control. I don't need it for what we're doing. You might, when you get through the end of the video and you figure out where we're at with this, figure out whether you need it or not. And then it says changes applied, reboot for changes to take effect. So I'm going to click the reboot button. And now we are back. When you boot it up, it's going to come up looking like this. And if you sit on it for a couple of minutes, which you should let everything settle out and get squared away. And we hit the DigiPy logo at the top. For some reason, this thing has been starting the APRS iGate, there it is, by default. It's probably the way he's got it configured to do that kind of thing. But that interferes with the WinLink gateway because they both use Direwolf on the back end. So turn, wait for this to turn green, refresh a couple of times by clicking the logo. And then when you finally see that as green, click the off button and it goes off. And now that's gray. And here is all you have to do. You see this line that says WinLink email server? Hit on, okay. That's it. One of the things that I like to do, besides just that, like I said, it's really easy. Besides just that, is I like to hit the packet log button, and this opens up a new tab in your browser and starts the log of the software. So we can actually see in real time what's going on because this screen doesn't ever change. It's it's done. WinLink email server is on. I haven't asked to refresh the screen at all. Even if I do, it comes back and it's still green. But this screen here, on the other hand, this is where it gets interesting. Let me make a connection via radio to my gateway. And before we get too far into that, there is one thing I probably should tell you about, and you guys already know this. Find a frequency that's open, make sure it's cleared for your usage, and then go. This thing here, as you can see, it has beaconed, and it beacons on the dial frequency of the radio, because there's no need to you know, cat control, set a frequency or anything like that, because we're already there, because I already did all that stuff. In my area, that is 145.730. So tune your radio to 145.730 on FM data mode and listen for a while and see if there's anybody out there. PTT your mic and ask if anybody's out there. And if you get no response enough times, go ahead and use that frequency for a while. So I'm gonna use WinLink on Android to test this out. And I've already got my session all set up. That'll be a different video. I'm just going to connect to it from my two meter radio, which is, my, my favorite little Vero right here, and I'm doing it over Bluetooth, so there's no wires between the radio and the thing. So again, future video coming out, stay tuned for that. But I'm gonna hit play on the service, and there we go. You can see, and you can, maybe you can hear, I don't know. You can hear the stuff going back and forth. So KM9G sent a SABM command to KToads, and KToads has responded saying who it is, and then for some reason that got sent again. That's gonna happen a lot in packet radio. And KToads responded back, this is who I am, just like the last time I told you. And then I think this RR is ready to receive. And so now we're doing the whole transaction thing on the back end. This is KToads talking to cms.winlink.org over the internet and telling my Vero radio that it's, you know, I'm, I'm doing stuff, be patient. And then here's the whole rest of your protocol. But now you can see this stuff in real time. And if you hear your radio going crazy and you want to know what's going on, come in and take a look at the logs. And then finally, this last message down here says DISC, disconnect. So we have done a successful session. I have sent 58 bytes. I have received 72 bytes, and this is from the server side. So the server sent 58 bytes to the client and received 72 bytes from the client in 69 seconds. So 1.9 bytes per second, whopping speed. This is 1200 BPS, by the way, 1200 baud. So there you have it, the server is up and running. Okay, we request authorization to be a gateway. We received authorization to be a gateway. We downloaded some software, we installed some software, we configured some software, we got everything running. 
Now what? Okay, so here's where it gets interesting. There is a little bit more involved than just doing the stuff that we just did. If you're going to run a station full time, then you need to put in some thought as to how your station is going to work. You need to have positive lightning grounding because your station should be able to be left up and running all the time, whether you are local and can yank the antenna in case of a storm or not. You need to have battery backup that will last you the tide of the storm. And that backup needs to go for your radio and for the computer system that you're running as your gateway. In this case, it's a Raspberry Pi. My radio is the ICOM 705, which is a 10 watt radio, good enough for two meter work in my area, especially with a good tall antenna. And ours happens to be on top of a water tower. So we got that covered. And we're probably gonna do it with a different radio because 705 is too nice to stick in a water tower control room and collect dust. Possibly some spares in case the thing happens to go down, or at least a plan on how to get spares fast enough. Depending on how active your Winlink gateway is and how active your club is, you might have the budget to have a spare set of radios, antennas, coax, power cords, batteries, and Raspberry Pis, or Amazon Prime two day away might be fast enough. And in the case of stuff that happened a couple of years ago when we had a Raspberry Pi shortage the world over, then, you know, Waiting longer might also be part of your standard operating procedures. You need to define what those standard operating procedures are and you need to be comfortable with them. So if your standard operating procedure is in the event of an impending thunderstorm in the day's forecast, I have got the station unplugged all day long, so be it. If it is, we have a two day minimum service level agreement for what they call mean time to recovery, so be it. That's totally within your discretion to define as the club that operates the call or as the station owner that operates the call. The last thing you need to do is outside of the purview of this video would be to have some way to turn the radio off remotely. And that can be an internet connected Alexa device. It can be a tone that you send you know, via DTMF from your handheld, but make sure you have the ability to shut down the transmitter remotely so that you stay within the guidelines of your operating agreement with your government. All that aside, that was pretty easy, wasn't it? So that's one of the reasons why Craig gets the, the big bucks over on Patreon. So make sure that you are a Patreon member in order to get his software. There will be links for all of this stuff in the description down below. And we're going to have a lot more fun with this in the future. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel. So next up, we've got to get the handheld radio configured, the client configured. This was the K-Toads Windling Gateway. I'm going to do the KM9G HT coming up in a future video, so make sure you're subscribed for that. Bluetooth KISS TNC over an HT connected via Android? Yes, please. In the meantime, there is a video right over here I think you might enjoy next. Thanks for being awesome. I'll see you over there.